My job is watching a woman trapped in a room. Three years ago, I was looking at the local jobs online when one of the ads caught my eye. Not because of what it said, but because it said so little. Best I remember, the ad just read job available, good pay, no benefits, discretion required. It then listed an email address and that was all. At the time, I was managing a music store, but I already started hearing rumors that we'd be shutting down within the next year and the likelihood of transferring to another store was slim. I had been morosely looking at job listings for the last few days, but this was the first one that stood out. If only because I was bored and it was weird, so I sent an email. Half an an hour later, I had a response telling me to go to a particular office building in an upscale part of the city at a precise time for my screening. After waiting in the lobby for a few minutes, I was taken to an office where I was given a series of forms and questionnaires to fill out. They collected them and told me they would be in touch. I had almost forgotten about the whole thing until a month later, I got a call saying I'd moved on to the second stage of the hiring process. I was given a different address and time, and when I arrived, I was met by a man who introduced himself as Mr. Solomon. He escorted me into a large room that contained a chair and a desk. On the desk were two large monitors, a keyboard and a mouse, and a bolted down metal box with two oversized buttons on it, one red and one green. He told me this room was a model for the room I'd be working in if I took the job. He described the job as follows. I would be working seven shifts of six hours every week. My job was simple. I would arrive at work 10 minutes early and enter an outer area that was like a locker room. I would have my own personal locker. I would store all belongings in the locker and change into the provided work clothes. I was never under any circumstance to carry any item of my own into the surveillance room. I was never under any circumstance to take any item with me from the surveillance room. As for for what I was to do in the surveillance room, I was told that the monitor on the left would constantly show a live stream from a high definition camera in a remote location. My job was to simply watch the camera. Once an hour, I'd use the computer to enter a brief log describing anything interesting that occurred in the last hour. I was never allowed to take any handwritten notes about the work. As for the red and green buttons, the red button was only for emergencies. This meant something on the video or in my workspace required outside help. The green button was to be used if I saw something on the video feed that was particularly noteworthy. Solomon stressed that I should only use the green button when something of real significance occurred. He pointed out the camera on the ceiling of the room we were in. He said the real room would be the same. My work would be observed and other people were watching the room on the video feed as well. He said I was only a redundancy in case other systems failed. He then smirked and asked if I knew what he meant by redundancy. I nodded, trying not to show my irritation. I don't talk that good to people, but sometimes they think I'm dumb. That's okay, let him think that if he pays me good enough. Follow for part two. My job is watching a woman trapped in a room. The pay was good, $35 an hour. This worried me. I was already thinking this was some kind of psych experiment or secret government job, which I was okay with. But that kind of money to sit and watch a screen? My mom always told me if something seems too good to be true, it probably is, and this was seeming too good to be true. I asked if I was doing anything illegal. Solomon laughed and said no. I asked if anyone was going to get hurt. Again, he shook his head no. He said the reason they were paying so much was because they needed employees that were motivated to be professional and discreet. The work they were doing was important, and for various reasons, it couldn't be discussed. If I took the job, I would have to sign papers promising I would never discuss my work there or I would be sued or locked up. I'm only breaking that now because of everything that's happened. So I took the job and because they wanted me to start right away, I had to quit the store with no notice. I felt bad about that, but I was also excited about the new job too. It was a lot of money and seemed like easy enough work if a bit boring. I was nervous that there was something more to it, but I told myself I would just have to see. No point in chickening out and wasting a good chance just because I let my imagination go crazy. I was given the location of the job itself and when I went there, I was amazed to see it was just like the model room with only a few differences. There was a locker room you had to pass through to get to the surveillance room and there was a small bathroom attached also. The real room had a small water cooler in the corner and because I wasn't allowed to bring anything in with me, I had to eat before and after every shift. The biggest difference, of course, was that the monitors were turned on. The right monitor was just a black and white terminal like you see in the movies. I would type in my logs, but there was no internet. The left monitor was a video of a room. You can call it a bedroom, I guess, because it had a bed in it, but it also had a lot of other stuff. A TV, a sofa and chairs, a couple of tables and plenty of empty space in between. The camera must be high up in a corner because I could see pretty much everything except the far left sides of the furniture. At first though, I didn't notice any of that stuff. All I saw was her. She looked a bit older than me and was very pretty. When I first saw her, she was laying on the side of the sofa. That was a part of the room furthest away from the camera, but the picture was very clear and I could tell that she was sleeping. I found myself leaning into the monitor more so I could see her better than I thought about what I was doing and felt embarrassed. It was like I was spying on her. A peeping Tom, my mom used to call it. I didn't want to be a peeping Tom, but I also didn't want to be silly either. I needed to think about it slow. It was a good job and I I wasn't doing anything wrong, right? I wasn't hurting anybody, the woman looked fine and the room was nice. She probably agreed to be there and it was all some sort of experiment, I was just overreacting. So I sat down in the chair and began my work. It didn't take long before I understood more. The woman who I began calling Rachel wasn't there of her own free will. I never saw her hurt, but it was clear that she never left the room except to go to the bathroom which my camera couldn't see. Well, she never left the room on her own. Periodically, usually a couple times during my shifts, men and women in strange looking outfits would come in and take her from the room. Sometimes she would struggle, but usually she would just go along with her head hung low. Follow for part three.